Hey YouTube, Mr. Terry back here once again for another History Teacher Reacts video. Today I'm going to be watching a video series that won this week's uh, poll on Patreon. Uh, Patreon members get to choose a video about once a week to uh, for me to watch. And the one that won this week is Extra History Series on uh, the Bismarck, the World War II German battleship. Um, so... That's awesome. I'm excited to, to check this out. This Again, this was uh, highly recommended and won the poll for the week. If you'd like to participate in the poll, um, all you got to do is become a Patreon uh, pledger um, of any financial level, and you can have a little bit more influence on what this uh, channel gets viewed. So we'll go ahead and start this. Um, just taking a glance, it looks like this is a four-part series, so I'll probably do uh, two videos uh a video with two videos each um, so today what we'll be doing is watching parts one and part two and then we'll do a follow-up video with uh, with three and four um, as always with react videos um, I encourage you that if you like the original video that you make sure to go over to their channel um, there'll be a, a description you know, in the description a link that you can go check out the original video give them a like and subscribe and if you haven't subscribed to this channel like the idea of um, um, reacting to and watching history videos, then definitely invite you to uh, join us by subscribing. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So like we're starting, uh, this video, first video is, so we got Hunting the Bismarck, the Pride of Germany. First scene right here, May 20th, 19. Let's see where they start us. Okay, let's check it out. 1941. A restaurant in Stockholm, right, 1941, a British in the heart officer, of the, war. the naval attaché to neutral Sweden, is having dinner alone when the waiter interrupts him with a telephone call from the embassy. His eyes widen. He slams down the receiver uh -oh. and rushes out. Waiting for him at the embassy is a Norwegian colonel, the man Swedish intelligence leaks to when they want information to land in British hands. He has a sighting report from a Swedish cruiser. They relay it to London via uh -oh. encrypted telegram, Must be the and it says... At 1,500 hours, two large warships, escorted by three destroyers, five ships, and 10 or 12 planes, passed to the northeast. The ships are German, and the hunt is on. Yeah, the hunt for the Bismarck is kind of legendary. Um, some of the real finite details, um, I don't know. Um, I did not specialize in World War II history, um, going through my education process. So I got like kind of the I got the, a lot of the basic stuff, and I'm learning a lot more because that definitely seems to be the most studied of you know all the times of history. But as somebody like myself that really um, generalizes across history, there are so many details um, of things that you know I didn't get, and uh, I know this one gets talked about a lot, and I know about the um, of course the 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 um, um, naval battles of World War II for sure, um, but getting some real specific uh, details of this kind of legendary larger-than-life ship, um, I'm really excited to to go ahead and look into. All right, let's see what they got. This episode is sponsored by Wargaming. Download World of Warships and use the code EXTRA1 for free goodies. Link in the description. Makes sense they would do this. The Hunt for the Bismarck is one of the most you know, dramatic events of World War II. It's with a the game. story of great ships really clashing smart. in frozen waters. A tale of risk-taking, heroism, and <coughs> shocking loss. And the blind luck that sometimes changes history. So sure. when Wargaming contacted us again saying that they wanted to sponsor a series of episodes on the Bismarck, uh, we jumped on that right away. But what makes cool. the Bismarck cool, uh, story interesting isn't just the ships and the battles, it's the hunt. For the Royal Navy, the biggest Never played problem the World of wasn't Warships sinking games. the Bismarck, Heard it about was them, finding but... it. This is a detective story Maybe writ large, fun. an international manhunt that stretched from the icy seas of the Denmark Strait to the chattering computers of Bletchley Park. It will begin with an interrupted dinner and end with the destruction of the largest battleship on Earth. Allow me to set the scene. 21st of May, early morning, a British naval base at Scapa Flow. Vice Admiral John Tovey, commander of the home fleet, is aboard his flagship thinking that this might finally be it. For days, German reconnaissance planes have passed above him, recording the position of his ships. Scapa Flow is a hard station, a barren rock in freezing seas, but it's also strategically yeah. crucial real estate. From their base in Scapa, Tovey's fleet guards the watery expanse that stretches between Greenland and Nazi-occupied Norway. You know, um, to chime in here, you, the uh, you know battle kind of for the, the the Atlantic here is such a big deal, um, especially early in the war too, for the fact of trying to control 
the enemy um, supplies coming in and out, especially ones coming out of like the United States and other places like that. Um, so yeah, controllers regions. If you're wondering like why the heck are people you know clear the clear up here you know what i mean um and not just fighting right along the sort of seashore borders of uh of the the nations um at world war ii but you can see there's um controlling this entire region is both militarily and economically important right so um yeah you're talking vast expanses here to have to try to um go over and you could see like with what the germans were doing in uh trying to capture norway you are yeah capturing norway you're getting um them having more and more access to the atlantic guards the watery expanse that stretches between greenland and nazi occupied norway and securing that line was the only thing keeping britain alive this is a crucial juncture in the war. The previous year, France had collapsed. German forces had occupied Norway and Denmark, and the Italians had entered the war yeah, on the lot side of, of its fascist uh, ally, control Germany. of shorelines. The Axis powers were now masters of Europe, and Britain stood alone, besieged in its own islands. As Luftwaffe raids pounded its cities, Luftwaffe, American supply convoys were the only thing keeping Britain in the fight. This was a tonnage war, measured in cargo delivered rather than ships sunk. Convoys raced yes. through U-boat infested waters to get Fortress Britain enough food, bullets, and oil to defend democracy. You know, Britain being a small country and an island nation is completely dependent. I mean, I shouldn't say completely, but very, very dependent more than anybody else on um, shipping. So you could see uh, why the Germans had invested so much in trying to basically capture as much of the northern atlantic as possible i mean that is a key part of uh, potentially having victory against them especially one with uh, historically such a strong navy like the british waters to get fortress britain enough food bullets and oil to defend democracy tofi's nightmare was of a single ship the bismarck British intelligence had been building a file on her for some time, even attending her launch in 1939 and monitoring her sea travels via air and signals intercepts. Um, before maybe they explain it, I'm assuming the Bismarck was named after Otto von Bismarck. I would, I would think that's that's there. If I'm wrong, correct me. Um, unless it was named for specifically another one, but um, very important person in uh, German history. Um, I saw Extra History did a, um, a series on Otto von Bismarck. Um, if that's something you'd like to see, definitely suggest it if it's uh, you feel like it's a good one. They still didn't know everything. They didn't know how fast she was, her crew complement, or what new technologies she had. Just know it's big, right? Had, but they did know that she was enormous and right. advanced, outfitted with tell that from heavy pictures. armor and 15-inch guns that could sink near anything the Royal Navy could throw at it. That's but crazy. the British also yeah. knew that Bismarck was more than a ship. She was a political statement. Hitler had jump-started Germany's economy with public spending, including a focus on military rearmament. The Bismarck was a visible symbol of Germany's economic miracle. An economic miracle and everything, right? Now, remember, in World War I, the Treaty of Versailles um, basically reduced the German Navy to nothing. Um, to nothing. Um, and he, you know, was building that up. So they had kind of been behind, I guess, in a way, in some of the naval development because of that. But as we know, the Treaty of Versailles was not very well, um, like, uh, like uh, actually, like, protected in a way, influenced and, and, and uh, monitored as they were able to even develop a navy at all. So, yeah, this is quite, um, this has been a really massive rearmament very, very quickly when you look at it from the big sense of what the Germans were doing in the interwar years. Terry rearmament. The Bismarck was a visible that's not just the Navy. There were not an Air Force miracle. either. A nation with and a very limited amount of tanks employment and soldiers. Rate, provided you didn't count the Jews and the women forced out of the workplace. And at over 40,000 tons, Bismarck was also a flagrant violation of post-World War I treaties that limited the size of Germany's naval vessels. This ship celebrated the Nazi success and proclaimed their warlike intentions. This was a new Germany, an economically strong Germany that had military ambition and rejected any attempt to restrain it. But so far, this great ship was still bottled up in the Baltic, operating out of ports in northern Germany and occupied Poland. But if the Bismarck could stage a breakout, slip between Denmark and Norway, and cut north into the Atlantic, it could plunge down into the Atlantic convoys. A For knife sure. straight into Britain's supply artery. Previous German raids had proved costly. This could wreak havoc on merchant ships. And those ships had only been a quarter ships. the size of the Bismarck. 
Tovey's phone rings, a direct line from the Admiralty in London. The call passes on the Swedish Navy's sighting, but now it's corroborated with more information. A Polish source reported that the Bismarck left port three days ago, and a Norwegian resistance cell spotted a group of German ships passing between Norway and Denmark. Royal Air Force reconnaissance planes, they say, are currently scouring the fjords. Tovey issues an order to his fleet, refuel, and stand by to sail. 1315 okay. hours in Norway. An RAF pilot cruising the fjords spots and photographs a large ship with a heavy cruiser nearby. Back in Scotland, an analyst confirms the silhouette while the photos are still damp from the darkroom. It's the Bismarck, probably with the heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen. The photos confirm Toby's sure. greatest Very common, fear. you know, for ships Worse, to travel Worse, the weather is deteriorating. With fog Both forecast with overnight, and, uh, Bismarck had probably been uh, hiding planet. in the fjords, waiting for just such weather to cover its dash to the Atlantic. Tovey summons his subordinate, Tovey Vice Admiral Lancelot to keep it hidden. Holland, and details his plan. Holland will take his squadron to southern Iceland and hold there, staying in a position to intercept the Bismarck regardless of whether she sails down the east or the west coast of the island. Tovey will stay in Scapa in case the Bismarck tries to use the foul weather to sneak past the north side of Britain. The cruisers currently patrolling the Denmark Strait would stay on course with orders to spot and shadow the Bismarck, then radio its course so Holland can intercept. Holland's squadron slips out at midnight. 22nd of May, at 0200 hours in Norway. An RAF bombing raid hits the Bismarck's last known position, releasing their payloads blind due to the low clouds. Heavy fog, no sighting. Further reconnaissance flights are futile for the next several hours. You know, it's pretty amazing that they were able at all to, to really hide it, right? Something that big. Um, and be that big, uh, well-known, but also have it ac accompany accompanying ships with them. And so it's pretty amazing that they're able to do that at all, to be honest. Heavy fog, no sighting. Further reconnaissance flights are futile for the next several hours. 20 hundred hours in the Scapa flow. Admiral Tovey, who has been living next to the phone for the last 24 hours, receives a report from the Admiralty. A daring reconnaissance plane has flown low enough to break through the clouds. The Bismarck is gone. Any further mm. reconnaissance flights are grounded due to poor weather. He orders Ghost the command ship? to sail for Iceland immediately, hoping to fill any gaps in their screen. In the 30 hours since the last sighting of the Bismarck, the German raiders could have sailed 600 miles toward the Atlantic access points around Iceland. As Tovey leaves port, he radios Holland to say that Bismarck is heading his way, and that the fleet must maintain radio silence. The Bismarck has slipped through okay. the first net. It Here must not shut slip up. <laughs> through another. 23rd of May, 1922 hours, the Denmark Strait. Two sister the cruisers tough part. have been searching the icy, mine-filled waters big of the Denmark water. Strait for 50 hours, ever since the Bismarck was last spotted, when a lookout sees two ships emerge from a snowstorm. He thinks they're British at first, but a so it just had one accompanying ship with scrambling. it. It's a German battleship, and only seven miles away, well within the killing range of its 15-inch guns. Action station sound. Oh, the officers below abandon their pre-dinner sherry. Running feet pound the deck. The cruiser turns hard over and makes for the fog. Get its eight-inch guns useless against the steel behemoth. Yeah. For three agonizing minutes, the crew waits for incoming shells as their little ship slowly takes cover in the mist. The Bismarck's shells never arrive. Reorienting herself, the cruiser stalks its quarry through the fog and the rain. Maybe the Bismarck at this point just doesn't want weapon, to be found. You know a what sensor I mean? array. And These cruisers the may not have heavy guns, but they're outfitted with advanced systems that allow them to track enemy ships solely by radar. At least not till it gets never to its achieved final before. position. The cruiser radios its sighting report to her sister ship 15 miles south, who relays it to the rest of the fleet and rushes to join the pursuit. An hour passes. 2030 hours, the Denmark Strait. Over eager and heading at speed, the second cruiser plunges through a fog bank to find itself nearly head on with the Bismarck, Ooh. six miles away and closing at 30 knots. They think they can Her take it? The captain orders the helm hard to starboard and deploys a smoke screen, breaking for the mist. This time, the Bismarck is quick on the draw. A salvo of 15 inch shells lands behind the vessel's stern, rattling it with metal splinters. Another shell lands 50 yards short and skips like a stone over the bridge. But the cruiser escapes, shrouded in mist. 
the twin cruisers, a Thanks little wiser fog, huh? and a bit more careful, fall in behind the Bismarck and the Prince Eugen, staying out of sight but within the 10-mile range of their radar arrays, quietly broadcasting Bismarck's position to the fleet. 2100 hours, the interception fleet at Denmark Strait. Admiral Holland's battlecruiser force plunges towards the Bismarck. There are rough seas and snow flurries in the strait, with waves so high that their destroyer escorts are getting submerged. And Weather on those seas is awful. Destroyers will do little Cold, good anyway. icy, windy, Holland stormy. Knows. This will be a two-on-two -two battle of capital ships. At his disposal, he has the newest ship in the British fleet, the Prince of Wales, and his flagship, big, big the pride of the Royal Navy, the HMS Hood. The Hood has been called the most right. beautiful ship two on two showdown. Between the wars, she had circumnavigated the globe as a symbol of British invincibility. She's the star of fleet That's reviews impressive. and propaganda reels. Many of her crew got their first taste of Navy life by seeing her at holiday parades or through childhood tours of her deck. She is the beloved, the unsinkable, the mighty Hood. And she is steaming towards destruction. Join us next time for a clash of flagships, yeah. a wounded giant, and a three-word order that will echo throughout naval history. So you basically got here early on a head-on, head-on-head, or head-to-head -head battle of like the two um, best ships in the fleet, right? So yeah, that'll be interesting to see it. Uh, to see it, I mean, um, it sounds like the Bismarck really though is is kind of on paper the one that should win here so all right cool well yeah they were able to um at least for this first episode kind of introduce it a little bit um, i'm glad they talked about how important how important the uh the the sea trade routes um and uh and it just controlling the, the the coast was so important for the germans um against especially britain because of their island nature and the uh, need to be able to influence um uh, goods coming in and out of course your your enemy nation so okay very cool other than that um yeah sounds good so far let's go ahead and jump over to um video two all right so this is uh, yeah the second video Hunting the Bismarck, um, the mighty HMS Hood. So we're going to be talking British here. So we got a real big heavyweight clash right here. If you want to relate it to a boxing match, let's see. Let's see what happens. I think we know who's going to win, though. You know, and you got to remember, too, that, I mean, the history of Britain has basically been of the greatest navy in history. You know what I mean? And, and very rarely... Um, could see these, you know, big uh, defeats before. Whereas the German Navy, um, you know, German history just in general is not necessarily known for being able to compete that much with, with a a, a bigger navy like um, like uh, the history of the of the British Navy. So this is um, this is a big moment, I think, actually for showing uh, military superiority on water. You know what I mean for the British, as they'd been very good with that since uh, the First World War too. So. Um, I um, mean, being very innovative, you know, with with them innovating uh, U-boats, which are basically, you know, basically submarines. Um, so you're seeing that new stage of warfare here in the 20th century, though, where naval battles are really taking a new level and have become industrialized. Right. None of this would be possible as without the result of the Industrial Revolution that happened uh, just decades before. All right, so the uh, yeah mighty the HMS, HMS Hood. Hood and Prince of Wales plow toward the Bismarck versus and destiny. the Bismarck. Wants to bet. Who are we putting money down? Who's, who's going to win this Download thing? Download World of Warships and use the code Extra One for free goods. Although if we know, Link in the we know it's a four-part series. Even off, if you don't know anything about the Bismarck, I think you're going to know what happens. The battleship Bismarck and the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen as they steamed wouldn't it? south through the Denmark Strait. And with Admiral Tovey and the rest of the home fleet still hundreds of miles away, it was clear that the Hood, pride of the Royal Navy, and Prince of Wales were the only ones that could possibly you're stop. On your own. Venus. Hood and Wales. To understand what's about to happen, we need to understand the state of the Royal Navy in 1941 and okay. how interwar limitations held back their naval development. For that, allow yeah. me to turn things over to War Gaming's military expert, Richard Cutland. Cool, cool, Following cool. World War One, a series of maritime treaties constrained naval development in the hopes of defusing an international arms race. 
At first, these treaties limited the number of new ships and set limits on the size and armament of new vessels. But later agreements eliminated the possibility of building new battleships completely. As a result, in the interwar period, Britain was forced to modernise old ships instead of building new ones. For example, the HMS Hood was cheaper, strong enough right? to any outside observer, but the British Admiralty was well aware of its main drawback, a weak horizontal defence, especially at Deck 25, which was only 76 millimetres thick. Head on. Plans to strengthen the horizontal armour had been developed back in 1927. But these works were postponed due to financial problems. Great Depression. In the end, I mean, they they well, not 27, but and this made the ship afterwards, vulnerable after to long-range plunging fire that fell directly down on its deck. These treaties also constrained new battleships, like Prince of Wales, to quite conservative designs. Their armament consisted of two four-gun turrets and one two-gun turret, all in a 14-inch caliber that complied with treaty so limitations. Big. Meanwhile, Germany That's was quietly violating caliber. these treaties with ships like Bismarck that had 15-inch guns. So even though Prince of Wales was brand new, it was underpowered at launch. Mm. In addition, the brand new Prince of Wales had teething problems. New doesn't necessarily mean better, right? revealed that her revolutionary quadruple gun turrets were prone to break down under strain. And this problem hadn't yet been fixed when she deployed with Hood. However, Prince of Wales was more technologically advanced than the Hood, particularly since she had modern rangefinders. Right, right. And crucially, both Hood and Prince of Wales were fast, and speed was what the Royal Navy needed in an interception force. Back okay. to you, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Cutland. We'll so see that's the, fight. the situation. The capable but vulnerable Hood and untested Prince of Wales are about to take on the largest and most modern warships on Earth. 24th of May, 0537 hours, the Denmark Strait. Bright and Our early, British huh? sailors have gotten a little sleep, knowing that they would intercept the Bismarck at dawn. On the Prince of Wales, civilian contractors have worked through the night repairing its turret guns, whose hydraulic systems are acting up. Uh -oh. Most of the Prince of That's Wales crew are fresh recruits, and they're nervous. But the presence of the Hood stills their jitters. Just then, a lookout on Hood sees smoke on the horizon. The Bismarck and the Prince Eugen. Admiral Holland sends a ciphered message to the rest of the fleet. From Hood, enemy in sight, am engaging. But Holland's running almost parallel to the enemy, the four ships converging slowly as they head southwest. That's no good. Not only does he need to get between Bismarck and the Atlantic, but the Hood's thin deck armor will be right. vulnerable to plunging fire unless he gets within nine miles. Well, yeah, and they said how um, the, the British, uh, was it the Hood or the, the Wales they said that was... Um, not nearly as good as at the horizontal defense so not a good position you want to be you got to get your angle perfect in naval um naval combat right otherwise you know it's all it's so much of it's geometrical right if you're coming at wide and that sort of thing you make yourself a bigger target right and especially for your how your ship's designed what is your um sh ship more with um or able to withstand so they better get the maneuvers right by cutting a path directly toward the Germans, he'll close the distance as fast as possible and be harder to hit, but it'll also have his firepower since his rear turrets can't join the fight. But okay. there's nothing so gotta, for it. The Bismarck could still evade. Kind of a drawback. Collins turns to an interception Pros and course cons. and orders full speed ahead. At 0552 hours, Holland orders Prince of Wales to target the lead ship. But the gunnery officer on the Prince of Wales, working with more modern optics, makes a startling realization. What? The Hood has targeted the wrong ship. Uh, Bismarck and Prince like Eugen have similar silhouettes, the thing you need and to the figure Germans out have first. defied convention by sending the lighter armored heavy cruiser first. He tries to communicate this to the Hood, but it's too late. The Hood opens so you're fire, wasting your, breathing the your vessel first, in dirty browns. Your, your first shot is so important, right? It really can set the tone for the battle. So if you mess up that, that can that can mess up the whole thing. So I wonder if someone got fired for that. The Hood, but it's too late. The Hood opens fire, wreathing the vessel in dirty brown smoke. Seeing this, the desperate gunnery officer defies the Hood's order, targets the Bismarck, and fires. On both ships, the gunnery officers look at their watches, waiting. Fifty seconds later, pillars of water leap up in front of the German ships. The salvos fall short. Worse oh. still, one of the guns in Prince of Wales' B turret malfunctions, oh. taking it out of the action. Both ships are readjusting wah, their aim wah. when flashes of light run up and down the German ships. 
A long-range artillery duel has begun. Here it comes. Two minutes later, a shell from Prince Eugen crashes into the hood's upper deck, detonating an ammunition locker. Just right away. It burns with wow. pink flames, anti-aircraft shells cooking off in bunches like firecrackers. Direct hit. On the hit. hood's bridge, the crew can hear the screams of their burning shipmates coming through the voice pipes. Admiral Holland keeps calm, but then huge columns of water leap into the air ahead of the bow, and he finally realizes that he's been shooting at the wrong ship. He hastily sends the order to retarget the Bismarck and orders a turn to port in order to bring his aft turrets to bear. It will expose him side on with the enemy, but with luck, the Hood's turn will pass just inside the nine mile mark and shield him from plunging fire. The turn comes just in time. Bismarck's next salvo thunders down right where the Hood had been headed. Okay. With all fire concentrated on Hood, Prince of Wales has been free to get range on the Bismarck and scores at least one hit. But her intricate four-gun turrets aren't holding up to the strain, and every few salvos, another gun goes out of action. And their guns just it are not Hood capable the turn, of this. Facing the German ships side on. A salvo from Bismarck brackets the Hood, shells landing on either side of the vessel. The Prince of Wales's commander, Captain Leach, knows that once a ship is bracketed, the enemy has you. He sees the Bismarck's guns flash in double time, and trains mm. his binoculars on the Hood to see the result. A shell plunges down on Hood's deck, just aft of the mainmast, and disappears. Two seconds later, the middle of the Hood erupts like a Roman candle, Oof. spraying flames hundreds of feet in the air. Think it's As over, Leach huh? looks on, horrified, a colossal explosion tears the ship in two, wow. the stern rising up out of the water as the bow sails forward under its own momentum. Yellow smoke blankets the carnage. In all the smoke, the Hood's bridge crew don't know where they've been hit or how badly. Bodies begin raining down on the bridge, thumping off the roof and landing on the wings. From below, the helmsman reports through a voice pipe that the steering isn't answering. The ship begins to list, first to port, and then capsizing 45 degrees to starboard. There's no need for an evacuation order. The crew lines up single file at the port side do? hatch, waiting their turn to scramble out. The squadron's navigating officer stands aside, letting junior seamen go first. One mm. crewman glances back, he sees Admiral Holland still sitting in his command down chair, with the ship, going right? down with his ship. Seconds later, the sailor steps off the hood and into the freezing water of the Denmark Strait. Above him, he sees the majestic lines of the hood, sinking in a V formation. A turret fires a last defiant salvo before it slips into the water. And then the suction pulls him under. On the Prince of Wales, Captain Leach orders an evasive maneuver to avoid colliding with Hood's rapidly sinking stern. It disappears underwater as they pass. Nothing remains of the Royal Navy's largest and most famous ship except a burning debris field. It's pretty amazing because, yeah, they're saying it's the largest, most famous ship, and it goes down, looks like, pretty easily. Uh, that's got to be devastating for this for this right here. Um, like, if that's the best you got right now. Now, it did, it was just the two ships, right? So, um, but nevertheless, I mean, that's, that's a big loss. Um, and a big, big, uh, prideful victory, you know, for the, for the Germans there to be able to do this. It's like, that's the best you got. Well, we took it down and we did it pretty easily. It is now one malfunctioning ship against two. Right. And Leach two has sailed and right better. into the Hood's former position. The Germans barely have to adjust their range finders. But just then, a salvo from Prince of Wales straddles Bismarck. Leach nods approval. Now that Prince of Wales has the correct range, she can bang. You could do something One now? compartment below the bridge, the navigation officer hears a crash above him. He shouts into the voice pipe, asking if everything's all right. At first, there's no answer. So this all seems from, they, they've done all from the British perspective, right? I haven't, heard, I haven't seen anything from the German perspective about this battle. Is there anything contrary that you know of? Um from yeah from their perspective about this what did they what did the germans think of those um the other ships um were they intimidated by them did they think they'd be stronger they'd be weaker i'd be interested to know that yeah this all seems british perspective and then a stream of blood dribbles out staining his charts wait, 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 leech wait, there's no answer and then a stream of blood dribbles out Coming staining out of his there? charts leech gets unsteadily to his feet one of the Bismarck's shells has hit the bridge and passed through without exploding. His entire bridge crew lies dead, except for two wounded officers. For three hellish minutes, shells pound the Prince of Wales. 
The armor belt takes multiple hits. The boat deck catches fire. In one of the turret magazines, a shell punches through the deck and lands, still live, next to a sailor's foot. The magazine crew is told to hang on to it until ordnance disposal arrives, but they're not waiting. They lift the shell up out that of the thing turret around. and gingerly carry it across the deck amid a full-scale battle. With a sigh of relief, they pitch it over the side. Captain Leech knows he's been outfought. Be he turns to withdraw, that. making smoke to cover his retreat. The Bismarck, Smart. curiously, does not follow. Keeping well out of range, Leech brings the mauled Prince of Wales around to join the cruisers shadowing Bismarck. He signals the Admiralty. Hood has blown up. One hour after the Hood's sinking, a destroyer arrives to look for survivors. On deck, they have rafts, life belts, and blankets lined up and ready. The medical crew is prepared to treat hundreds. Instead, they pull three oil-slicked survivors out of the water. Three That's out of it? a crew of 1,418. 1022 out. You know, you'd just assume that, I mean, the, the ships, the corridors are so small and getting out, there's probably a ton of people that could, could just couldn't get out in the first place, right? Also shows you a lot about the, um, also just the, the icy, cold um, nature of the North Atlantic too here um, is brutal. But that's incredible out of over a thousand people stationed on that ship that they're only able to pull out three. That's, um, that also, you know, probably means a lot of lot, a lot of people were killed on impact right that that weren't alive um when the ship started going down anyways hours the admiralty 1418 1022 hours the admiralty faces are grim in the admiralty's war room 200 feet below the streets of london the shock of losing the hood is compounded by the knowledge that German battleships were now in position to prey on vital convoys. Mm, but as the yeah. news settles in, bleak horror That's the gives long way to determined this. rage. The phone rings. It's Prime Minister Churchill with a personal order for every able ship in the Atlantic. It is direct and to the point. Admiralty cipher officers broadcast the order wide. The aircraft carrier Ark Royal receives the signal at Gibraltar and begins to unpack its torpedo bombers. Tovey's home fleet receives the message as they race to join the stricken Prince of Wales. The battleship Rodney, headed for a refit in Boston, gets the signal and slowly turns its 16-inch guns back toward Europe. The airwaves are thick with this one message. Sink the Bismarck. Sink the Bismarck. Sink the Bismarck. Everybody, go. <laughs> yeah um they're in trouble right i mean they're in trouble they had the best there and now the bismarck is far more freed up to go and do more damage again especially with the shipping lanes um getting through the straits of denmark that's kind of the most challenging thing and biggest obstacle they need to to get over and now if they're able to do this that could have a major implication on the war for sure um yeah, with that being able to happen. So it looks like this, I mean, the Bismarck just comes out totally unscathed. It's stronger again, bigger. It's got plenty of speed. And it looks like right here specifically, um, its range is what's really helping it right now. So that is um, a big help. You wonder, too, if the British are afraid that there's more of these. Like, are they sure that this is the only one in the fleet that is like this? Because think about that. If that was the first one you've seen, man, what if you worry there's a fleet of those? That would be uh, frightening, especially after you've just thrown out your best stuff. Okay, well, cool. Um, so this was videos one and two of this series. There are two more, so um, stay tuned for um, another video from me covering the, the last two there. So that'd be great. Um, like I said before, if you like the original video, uh, make sure to go to the link in the description with the uh, link to the original video so you can give them like and subscribe and um, support all of the ways that you can you can support them. Uh, a few invitations for you from my side of things. Um, if you enjoyed this, just kind of be able to see kind of a, um, a perspective. Uh, you know, on, on, um, these historical subjects, I invite you to subscribe. Um, we do a lot of live, um, premieres as well. So if you'd like to join those, sometimes, uh, clicking that notification bell is good for that. It'll tell you when, when things go live. Um, there are a few ways you can support the channel too. Um, you can also join our Patreon. Um, like I said, at the beginning of the video, this video won the week's poll for video for, uh, me to watch. So Patreon members, uh, they get to vote, um, or have a poll specifically for them. Uh, with some suggested videos and they can they can uh, 
choose which one um, we definitely watch. Other ways to support, uh, you can uh, make donations through YouTube um, um, as uh, through the Super Chats as well as um, through Streamlabs. So lots of ways to support the channel. Um, never never uh, required, um, but always appreciated. Um, Thank you very much. All right, and then the last thing that to, to plug in, if you'd like to continue on with some more historical discussions, whether it's the Bismarck or anything with history, I invite you to join our Discord community. There'll be a link to that down below in the description as well. All right, with that, I think we'll call it here. Stay tuned for um, the uh, final video that I do on this series. Hopefully that'll be coming up soon. And once again, thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time.